Well, we've joined together in worship, and we shared the table together. Now we get to open our hearts to hear God's word. And as we learn in scripture, it is sharper than any two-edged sword and able to divide and to cleave even the bone and the spirit. So if you feel cleaved, I'm not sure if that's a word this morning, um, take it to God. He is a good shepherd and a good father. So the 1995 mystery thriller, The Usual Suspects, is one of my favorite movies. Now the plot follows the interrogation of a character named Roger Kint, a small time con man who is one of only two survivors of a massacre and fire on a ship docked in the port of Los Angeles. Through flashback and narration, Kint tells an interrogator, the interrogator, a, a, a convoluted story of events and of the mysterious crime lord by the name of Kaiser Soze, who has orchestrated some tremendous events. Now, what begins as a simple whodunit, there's a small crime at the beginning, is revealed over time to be this complex complicated plan of revenge and cover-up orchestrated by Soze to eliminate his enemies and any associates who might be able to identify him. As the story progresses, the identity of Soze is teased out and teased out and teased out, and in the final climactic moments, you learn his identity, and when you do, the rest of the story changes. It's one of those movies that you want to go back and watch again because now that you know the identity, all the details look different. I imagine it's um, somewhat similar to how the disciples were thinking when they wrote the Gospels because if we were to read the Gospels written as diary entries, it would make much less sense. This guy, Jesus, he's a carpenter. He's like walking on water. I have no idea what's going on. But instead, we have the telling after the events, and the details are fleshed out. Understanding identity does that to the story. Understanding that identity is shaped in purpose and revealed in action. As we understand identity, it changes the whole of the story that your being always should shape your doing, and yet we see that sometimes true identity is, is replaced by false identity. Sometimes we see that people think they're a certain thing, but really they're not. They act in a certain way, and yet there's this true identity at play that's often going on, and, and we see this tension going on, and it's the tension that we see in the passage that we're looking at this morning. The story of David and Goliath we see this tension and this dynamic between the true identity and the false identity. But before we get into that, I want to set things up with a little bit of a, a lesson. I know it's not always the way that we do things. It's a little, something a little more intellectual about how we should read Scripture. So as we're engaging with Old Testament stories, we need to let our shaping be framed by three ideas. The first is that these stories are to be read literally, in the sense that the historical, literary, and theological considerations are inseparable. The details of the story matter to the meaning of the story. So we've got to pay attention to that. The second is that the world described in the Old Testament and the New Testament is a single world of temporal significance. It all matters. So as we're reading these Old Testament stories and we're carrying them forward into understanding of things, it's to help shape our whole understanding of the way that the world and life works. And as a result, the third point then, the theological world described by the story of Scripture is one and only real world. It is the story and the world we find ourselves in. And as such, it embraces the experience of any age, of any reader, and it is the place where we can discover 
how our own experience and the world are figured within the biblical world. So that's what we're going to see this morning in the story of David and Goliath. We're going to see how we fit in the story of the world. To jump right into this, though, I'm going to read, well, not really the whole of the passage. We're going to work our way through the whole of the story, though. And I actually want to read it out in its entirety, broken up throughout my talk, because I think, well, I think just Scripture deserves a hearing. Um, I tend to think that God's words have more significance than mine. So let's begin. 1 Samuel chapter 17. Now, the Philistines gathered their forces of war and assembled at Sokah in Judah. They pitched camp at Ephes Damim between Sokah and Azekah. Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another with the valley between them. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. He was over nine feet tall. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs, he wore bronze greaves and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, This day I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. The first thing that I want to point out within the story here is the setting. Now the whole of the story, the events of David's life, are presented within the context of the opening chapters of 1 Samuel and carrying on. And, and what we see there is a world falling apart. The lamp of God or the, the presence of God in the world is dim. A woman is barren. The Philistines have captured the ark and taken it away. The judge Eli and his sons have died and the Mosaic tabernacle has been destroyed. A dark age is descending over Israel. And in the midst of this, Yahweh intervenes. Opening the womb of Hannah, bringing Samuel, bringing a new light into Israel, and as he always does, out of the darkness, begins creating a new future. And in the midst of this, we have the extended story of Saul, whose rise and fall as the king of Israel is much like an expanded story of Adam. The rise and fall of Adam, where Adam was called, equipped, and commissioned to be a co-creator with God in the world. He abdicated that, giving in to fear and shame and guilt. And into this, Yahweh stepped, bringing redemption and restitution and reordering and a foretelling of one who would eventually crush the serpent's head. And in the story of Saul, we see someone who is called, equipped, and commissioned to be a co-lead with God over the people of Israel. And yet, in fear, grasping for power, Saul takes what is not rightfully his. And the enemy begins to take over, and dominion changes the world shifts, and yet into that, Yahweh steps, bringing redemption and restitution and reordering, and a foretelling of one who will crush the serpent's head. We have at the beginning of this story, the Philistines standing on a mountain on one side and the Israelites standing on the mountain on another. And if you look back to the book of Deuteronomy, we see something quite similar. Moses 
is giving the word of the Lord, the law, to the people and says, now, I want you to recognize that if you are obedient to the law, if you follow my ways, there will be blessings. And if you do not, and you give in to fear and guilt and shame, there will be darkness and curses. So the way we're going to do this is I want half of you to stand on one hill and half of you to stand on the other, and you're going to shout at each other. There we go. The Philistines shouting curses upon the children of Israel. And yet, in the Deuteronomy record, what happens is after the curses are shouted, then the children of Israel are to shout back blessings. The Lord is with us. The Lord is with us. And if we obey, this is what will happen. But that's not what we see here. The cursings are being shouted, and the children of Israel walk back in fear. Darkness has entered the land. Darkness has entered the land. And so we see, in the midst of this, as darkness enters the land, Yahweh steps in to bring forward restitution and redemption and reordering. It begins. Now David was the son of an Ephrathite named Jesse, who was from Bethlehem in Judah. Jesse had eight sons, and in Saul's time, he was old and well advanced in years. Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul to war. The firstborn was Eliab, the second Abinadab, and the third Shammah. David was the youngest. The three oldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to tend his father's sheep at Bethlehem. For 40 days, the Philistine came forward every morning and evening and took his stand. Now Jesse said to his son David, take this ephah of roasted grain and these ten loaves of bread to your brothers and hurry to their camp. Take along these ten cheeses to the commander of their unit. See how your brothers are and bring back some assurance from them. They are with Saul and all the men of Israel in the valley of Elah fighting against the Philistines. Early in the morning, David left the flock with the shepherd, loaded up and set out as Jesse had directed He reached the camp as the army was going out to its battle positions, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines facing each other. David left his things with the keeper of the supplies, ran to the battle lines, and greeted his brothers. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance. And David heard it. When the Israelites saw the man, they all ran from him in great fear. Now the Israelites had been saying, do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his father's family from taxes in Israel. David asked the men standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? They repeated to him what they had been saying and told him, this is what will be done for the man who kills him. So we have the challenge. We have the darkness. We have the challenge. We have the Israelites. They know of the blessing. They know of the promise. They know what could come. And yet they respond in fear. Now fear, I've just been recently reading a book Talks a lot about fear. Fear, how does he describe it? He calls it as false evidence appearing real. The idea that what fear is, is seeing what's actually there, but giving it different meaning. Seeing what's actually present, but allowing it to mean something that it shouldn't. And that's what the Israelites have done. There's this basic, intense emotion that's welled up inside them because they detect some, to their mind, imminent threat. There's an immediate alarm. It mobilizes this this psychological change, this this dysfunction within them. And so they respond with a sense of anxiety and fear, of impending doom, and they flee. Instead of remembering, similarly, that passage in Deuteronomy where, where God says to his people, as your enemies come against you, have no fear. I will hand them over to you. 
The, the idea, do not be afraid, is presented in Scripture so frequently, it makes me think God knows something about us. If you were to take out your cell phone right now and imagine a text coming through, what is the one message that would terrify you the most? What is the one thing you don't want to see? What is the one message that would really frighten you? Now, our fears are real. We live in a broken world. There are real problems, real dangers, real enemies. How do we respond to these fears? The Israelites hid. I think we tend to respond in two ways. The first thing that we do is we just try and make everything safe. We recognize that danger is real, so we're going to make everything safe. We're protectionists, so we come up with codes, we come up with rules, we wear protective gear, we have helmets for everything. We define practices, we define behaviors, we define other people's behaviors. We do tell other people what to do because we want to make sure everything is safe. I think the other thing that we do is we just reject the whole idea of safety and we just charge into recklessness. We just say, you know what, nothing is safe, it's all dangerous, so we might as well just forget all of this safety stuff. Let's not think about it at all and let's just do what we want. And then you become blind to what are actually real problems that really need to be addressed. I think in both of those contexts, we forget that fear isn't always bad. It's okay to be afraid. There are real things to recognize as dangers. The question is, how do we respond? I'd say instead of seeing the threat and allowing it to mean something that it doesn't, this false evidence appearing real, we need to understand what is really true. We need to find out what actually counts, what actually means something. The problem isn't fear, it's an unchecked fear that leads to insecurity, a perception of our own inability. This fear that shuts us down, shuts down our creativity, shuts down our boldness, shuts down our bravery. The Israelites had forgotten God, his promises, his blessings, and instead they looked at the circumstance, had an unrealistic view of their danger. And as a result, as Proverbs says, the fear of man lays a snare. Proverbs 29, 25. But the rest of that says, whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. So the Israelites had adopted a false identity, forgetting who God was and who they were. They adopted a false identity. The story continues. When Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him and asked, Why have you come down here? And with whom do you leave those few sheep in the desert? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. Now what have I done, said David? Can't I even speak? He then turned away to someone else and brought up the same matter, and the men answered him as before. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul, and Saul sent for him. The next characters we come to in the story are Eliab and his brothers, David's brothers. Now, in this particular context, we've we got to go back a little bit to David's anointing. You know, in the previous chapter, we realized, we hear that Samuel went and anointed David. Now, it doesn't actually say that he anointed him king. So maybe the brothers don't quite know that he's to be king yet. Maybe David doesn't even know that he's to be king yet. But the brothers were present when David was singled out. The older brothers see the youngest brother singled out. Now, if you look in, in the Jewish history and the way that some of this is told, you, you remember that it, um, one of the Psalms, David says, in sin my mother conceived me. This idea that, that somehow sin was connected to David. Now, we tend to take that as saying that um, 
original sin, we are all sinners, and therefore in sin having not been redeemed. In sin, David was conceived because he received original sin from his parents. Some Jewish interpreters take that, there's a little bit more of a convoluted story where Jesse being a faithful, righteous man after having um, his seven children, seven being the divine number, had decided seven boys, I'm not going to have any more children. He says, I've done, I don't want to have any more sons because it would ruin the perfect number. And so he decides, I'm done. But his wife wasn't. And so she tricked him by getting her nurse to seduce Jesse, and then she substituted herself very much as some of our you know, other stories in the Old Testament. And as a result, Jesse doesn't know that he's the father of David. And so the family story is that David was born in adultery. So if this is in fact true, I'm don't necessarily think that it is, but it explains in part why David's brothers are so bitter. This younger son, the runt, who his father calls the runt of the family, the youngest one, this one whose birth we don't quite understand, potentially born in adultery, he's been anointed, he's somehow more special than us. David comes out to see what's going on, and the brothers look on this in comparison and anger, resulting in part, perhaps, I'm suggesting out of some shame. These brothers are among the fearful Israelites who have forgotten who they are, but not only that, David's brothers, the sons of Jesse, the son of Obed, the son of Boaz, the son of the Israelite army soldiers who came into and took the promised land, there is a long family history of bravery and boldness and courage and leadership an anointing in that family. And yet, they're hiding, and they see the runt come in, and I think his presence just shames them. This young runt is coming in and standing up where I can't. This unpleasant self-conscious emotion arising from a sense that, that there's something dishonorable about them. Now again, imagine looking at your cell phone. If you were to receive a text that said, I know that thing you did. Or I know what you said you were going to do and you haven't. You know, you're not as good as you make yourself out to be Sunday morning at church. How would that feel to be presented with that? It's pretty terrifying. This sense of shame that comes up from recognizing I'm not, I'm not quite, I'm not who I think I am. I'm not who I want to be, or I'm not who everyone else thinks I am. Shame is real. Disapproving eyes. Shame is real. We do fail to live up to all of our expectations. There's always someone who's probably a little bit better than you that makes you second-guess yourself. There are real insecurities. But similarly, how do we respond? Well, I think our society tends to respond through this sense of shame by putting an awful lot of pressure on us to conform. The way that we eliminate that is we just act like everyone else. Because if we all act the same and we all do the same thing, nobody stands out. We can't make anyone feel bad, so let's all be the same. Or... We have this hyperactive sense of my own personal pride that I am just going to be who I am and the rest of you can just suck it. <laughs> like, I'm just going to be me. And that is the reality. But in both cases, we're denying the intention of the gospel to bring unity and difference, to help us recognize that our difference and our uniqueness is good. It's not bad. It's not always bad to feel shame. In 1 Corinthians, Paul says, I'm trying to make you feel shame so that you recognize that there is something really good to strive for. And while an unchecked shame can erode our courage and fuel disengagement as it did with David's brothers, a real shame that I think David felt that there is something to be done here and nobody's doing it. We should feel ashamed as Israelites while well, David's brothers had forgotten, and they'd allowed that shame to overwhelm them, they'd forgotten who they were, David hadn't. And he stepped in, recognizing his children of Israel, that shame should spur us on to recognize who we are and what we should be doing. 
The story continues. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, you are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a boy, and he has been a fighting man from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Where the Israelites gave in to fear and David's brothers gave in to shame, Saul has just given in to guilt. He's the king. It's his job to fight. He knows that he's in the wrong, and he takes it out in anger on David. He calls David nothing but a boy. Now, the age of David at this time is in question. He's Saul's armor bearer, so according to the Mosaic law, he's supposed to be at least 20 years old to serve in the army. But whether they were following that or not, you know, if you do the chronology and you work your way back, David's somewhere between 13 to 15, but some interpreters have aged him as, as old as 28. In either way, according to Jewish law, he's not a boy anymore. He would have gone through his, his um, what is that, at 13, they have this, anyway, bar mitzvah, there you go. I mean, that's kind of a more current thing, but at that age, David would have been considered a young man. In the previous um, chapter when Saul can't sleep and he's recommended to come play the liar. He's called a young man, a warrior, a man of honor. So Saul, seeing this shepherd, willing to do what he's supposed to do, feels this sense of guilt and just takes it out on him, calls him a boy, and then in the end just tells him, just go and do it. Whatever you're going to do, just go and do. Essentially, in his mind, sacrificing David to Goliath. And I think... We need to recognize that our guilt, sometimes we feel guilt, the way that we handle our guilt. is Often I think we justify it to ourselves. We're unjustly harsh to others. Or we excuse ourselves and put blame on others as we see Saul doing. But similarly, the fear and the shame, this guilt can lead to a real knowledge of our transgression and what is good. Where Saul had supposed to do this good work, he didn't. And David is willing to. So then we read the actual fight. I'm going to skip down a little bit because I'm killing all my time here. David says, I got to go fight him. I got to go. So in verse 45, David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will hand you over to me and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. Today I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. And all those who gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's and he will give all of you into our hands. As the Philistine moved closely to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. And reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. David ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine sword and drew it from the scabbard. After he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and ran. Then the men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a shout and pursued the Philistines to the entrance of Gath and to the gates of Ekron. Their dead were strewn along the Shara road to Gath and Ekron. When the Israelites returned from chasing the Philistines, they plundered their camp. David took the Philistine's head and brought it to Jerusalem, and he put the Philistine's weapons in his own tent. 
As Saul watched David going out to meet the Philistine, he said to Abner, commander of the army, Abner, whose son is that young man? Abner replied, as surely as you live, O king, I don't know. The king said, find out whose son this young man is. And as soon as David returned from killing the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul, with David still holding the Philistine's head. Whose son are you, young man? Saul asked him. David said, I am the son of your servant Jesse, the Bethlehemite. What we see in David is that unlike the Israelite army, David rejected fear and remembered God. Unlike his brothers, who'd forgotten who they were, he remembered, I am the son of Jesse, I have been anointed. And unlike Saul, who gave in, who ran away from his responsibility, David walked in the way that God had called him. And pursuing God, he didn't let himself get forced into someone else's skin, into Saul's armor. He went out in the skin God had given him, that of a shepherd. He took his own tools. He took his own identity. He took what God had given him to go do God's work. Clarity about himself and his calling led to courage and conviction. And we see then that the true identity of David, his purpose as the anointed one, his purpose as the shepherd, his purpose as the warrior shaped his actions. And we see that the Israelites and his brothers and Saul, who'd forgotten their identity because of fear, because of shame, because of guilt, could not walk in their purpose. And their actions revealed it. As the worshiper, David remembered God. As a warrior, David remembered his identity. And as a shepherd, he used his skills. And as a result, unlike everyone else, David remembered that he lived in a land of giant killers and knew that he served a God greater than giants. And we read, if you continue to read the story of David and you keep going on, you realize David wasn't the only giant killer. Goliath had three brothers as large as himself, And each of them was taken down by a single Israelite in turn. People who remembered their identity and walked in it. Now, even as my storytelling has been intended to provide a true and essential telling of these events, there's more to it. The clues and signposts show to us that there is something else going on. And in the case of this book, in the book of Samuel, in the story of Israel, as it's told through the lives of Samuel, Saul, and David, we can draw parallels to Abraham, to Jacob, to Israel. And the identification of Jacob as as David, as the new Jacob, bringing about the kingdom, restoring the kingdom that Israel had once been, it points us to Jesus. David as a hero points us to Jesus as the hero. In killing Goliath, David brings Israel out of wilderness, out of fear, out of guilt, out of shame, and into God's blessings. We note that while David gives up the armor of Saul to walk in his way as a shepherd, he defeats Goliath, who's described as wearing scales, and taking his head, crushing the head of the serpent, In defying God, Goliath became nothing more than the beast that needed to be destroyed. Walking in his identity shapes David's purpose, and we see the same in Jesus. Ultimately, we see Jesus coming in the way as a carpenter, as a servant, as a friend, leading people out of wilderness, leading people into God's blessing, Similar to David, Jesus gives up the way of the world. We often heard him say, you have often heard it said, but I say to you, you expect people to do this, but I tell you to do something else. You want me to fight with the sword, but I refuse to do that. You want me to take over the Romans, but I will not do that. 
Jesus gives up the way of the world to walk in his own skin. And like David, Jesus left, leaves his place to come visit his brothers. Paralleling Jesus' obedience, walking as the Son of God. Like David, Jesus' identity was shaped in obedience by his purpose as the God-man, as the servant, as the Savior, as the King. The word that comes alive and walks among us, restoring life out of darkness. David as the hero over Goliath points to Jesus as the hero over death and points to us. Because if we are one in Christ, we are part of that same purpose. So using the theological framework of the Old Testament and how it points to Jesus, we recognize it always points to us. As the whole of human history prior to Jesus points us to Christ, the whole of human history after Christ is shaped by him. This church is to carry on the identity and action of David and Jesus. The church's identity is shaped by the identity of Jesus. We are to be like him, God-men, God-women. We are to be divine and human. We are to be servants. We are to be small s, saviors. We are to be comfortable walking out of our own place to find our lost brothers and sisters and bringing them into the land a blessing. The church's actions are to be shaped by that identity. We are bearers of the word to the world. We are to sacrificially give of ourselves to overcome the evils of sin and death. We are to bring the light of hope as David did, as Jesus did, and point to the coming kingdom and its blessings. And so I want to ask you, are you shaped by fear and shame and guilt? Or do you have a sense of your particular calling and identity within the identity of the church? David was a worship, a worshiper, a warrior, a shepherd. And what are you? Knowing that you serve a God greater than the giants of this world. What are the giants that you are called to kill? How do you carry the hope of the word? How does your life radiate hope to the world? Now I believe that God speaks to us through his word. So I believe that he has spoken to you. And I just want to close in prayer, but I want you all to take a moment in the midst of that to ask God a question. As I am praying, we'll take a minute to pause, and I want you to ask him, Father, what do you need me to know? And then I want you to follow that up with the question, Father, what do you need me to do? And now I'm putting it on you, that like David, you are forced into a question. Will I respond to God's answers in fear and guilt and shame and walk away? Or will I step forward and do it? Our Father in heaven, we thank you that you are good. We thank you that you speak to us through your word. We thank you that we have people to look to like David who will help us understand your son better and help us understand ourselves better. We thank you that you speak to us in community so that we know that we're not alone. And that when you speak to us and you've asked us to do something, there are those that we are close enough to that we can share it with and they can help us be faithful. So I just want to take a moment now, Heavenly Father, and ask with all of us here, Father, what do you need me to know?
And in light of that, Heavenly Father, I want to ask for each of us here, Father, what do you want me to do? Our Father in heaven, help us not to forget what you have said to us now. Help us take the time and be bold to share it with someone we trust. And help us, like David and like Jesus, walk in obedience so we can face down the giants in our lives and bring your word and your hope to the world. In Jesus' name. Amen.